And welcome back to Immersion Church. Once again, I'm Pastor Mark and just wanted to get with you a little bit. I know it's been a while since we've been together that I've done any teaching. And uh, what I'm going to reveal over the next four weeks is, is first a personal prophetic word that the Lord gave me and really, you know, made me dig deep into it to understand what he was speaking to. But then also once as I was digging into it, I realized and he made clear to me that uh, it's not only a personal prophetic word, but applies to everybody who follows him. And so there is going to be those aspects of prophetic understanding that's going to come out of this. I urge you to test everything that I say, just like always, and continue to go to the Lord and ask him, you know, all the appropriate questions so that you can glean from it what it is he's speaking to you. And in that, then you will come into a fuller understanding of what it is he's trying to communicate for your life. Because, I mean, my life is only a very small part of what the kingdom is all about. And and, and each of our lives together, you know, come together in such a way that we're, we develop, we become something greater than an individual. And that's, believe it or not, what this prophetic word is about. So I'm going to jump into the history of it a little bit and share with you how it came about and how he made me aware of this. Um, I don't know about you, but for a very long time now, I've been, I've been genuinely concerned about the direction that we're going as a people, as a nation, as a world. Um, it, it seems that there's a great deal of, of confusion, darkness, division, um, just struggle in every single sense of the word of just coming into agreement with anyone over, over a large scale. And so uh, in that, I was seeking the Lord and asking him, you know, Lord, what, what is it I'm, I'm not doing personally? You know, what is it that I'm not doing individually that can can help me to become more effective in this world that's, you know, basically ripping itself apart. And, and through that, he, he gave me a phrase. And the phrase he gave me is one promise, two nations. And I'm like, one promise, two nations. Okay. And then, of course, he started to remind me of scriptures as to where this was actually, he declared it in his word. And as I pursued that word and tried to understand what it was he was speaking about that word, uh, this, this promise, this one promise in these two nations, he started to unfold to me personally, first of all, like I said, this understanding that he desires for, for a, a personal relationship and, and and in one where we exercise full free will, right? Because we are, we're free agents. Uh, whether we like it or not, we have the ability to choose. And sometimes we, we make decisions that when we look back upon them with the light of time, we go, wow, that wasn't a good decision. And, and so in that, he then started to develop this idea of this one promise. And of course, I had to start there. I go, what's the one promise? And we're going to get into that. But before we get into these things, these the promise and the, and, and the two nations, I, I just wanted to share with you briefly that uh, this is something that still he's working on in me. I'm not perfected yet. I'm still coming to discover what it means to, to lay down myself and to follow him in obedience, just like you. So so don't think that I'm coming here and declaring something that I'm, I, I've got this all figured out because I don't. But what I can tell you is that what he's shown me and what he's done in my life since we've come back from the Philippines has been dramatic. And as you know, we went to the Philippines a little over a month ago. And everything that took place there was amazing. Thank you, each and everyone who not only prayed for us, but supported us, made it possible that we could go to that nation. And for me personally, I want to thank you because I actually received the beginning of the fulfillment of multiple personal promises, one of them being over almost 34 years old. That is incredible that it took, you know, this movement and this group of people coming together in agreement and allowing us to be their representatives in that nation so that I could go and receive the acknowledgement and, and the confidence that he's actually answering a, a, a prophetic promise he gave me personally all those years ago, all those decades ago. So that being said, we're going to jump in here a little bit, but I want to lay some groundwork and I want to kind of speak to the framework of what we're going to we're going to operate in so that we comprehend what it is uh, as I developed us. We're, we're talking about. OK, and again, this series is all about one promise, two nations. This is part one. There'll be four parts to it. OK, and, and we begin with we have to begin with the foundation. 
right? What is the foundation? Well, that is the one promise, okay? And we're going to go directly to Romans 6, 5. And I'm going to read out of the TPT. I think the Passion does a really good job here of expressing what the Lord was expressing to me as he started to unfold this and reveal it to me personally and then open it up to the church broader, okay? And here it is out of Romans 6, 5. For since we are permanently grafted into him to experience a death like his, then we are permanently grafted into him to experience a resurrection like his and the new life that it imparts. There it is. There's the promise. There's the promise of the garden, right? We're going to talk about that a little more. We're going to go into that a little bit more. But this promise, the origins of this promise goes all the way back to the beginning of Adam and Eve, right? And and why they were created and how they were created and what they were given in that creation. Okay, and this brings me to my first point. But before I go to my first point, let me make this clear. There's a couple things he highlighted out of this, this scripture out of Romans 6, 5. The first one jumped out off the page at me was permanently grafted. Huh, permanently grafted. Wow, there's a, that word permanently is an exciting word because it takes away some of the ambiguity of, you know, where do I stand, right? But it's important to recognize that we were grafted into something that we weren't originally designated to be in. And that goes back to the promise and why the promise is operating the way it is now versus the way it operated in the beginning. Right. Because in the beginning, there was no fall. And then another thing that you just want to make sure I was picking up on is there's this this death. Right. That is associated with this this experience, this promise. Right. And, and, and permanently grafted into him the experience of a resurrection. So, so there, there's, a, there's a double grafting here or two graftings here. Let's not miss this. The word says that, you know, um, when we are crucified with Christ, we're crucified into his death, right? So therefore, we're actually grafted into his death. What does that mean? That means that death, death's uh, sentence has been fulfilled in each one of us. And this is the power of what Jesus did. Okay, don't miss that. So, but this first grafting was all about entering into the death and so that deaths could be paid in full because the wages of sin is death. Okay, so that was paid for and this was all in this point. And then he goes on to say, okay, and the new life that it imparts what? Through the resurrection, because we were, it's that scripture also talks about not only were we were crucified with Christ, but we were also raised from the dead by the same spirit that raised him from the dead. Okay, and this resurrection, what so so what this does is it starts to define for us that because of a, a, a time and a place in our history, not in our lives, but in our history, something changed, okay? And this is where this two-nation idea starts to come in. But here's my first point. The promise of God has not changed. It's important that we drill this home and we understand that the promise of God has not changed. What's the promise? To be with him, to be one with him. And we're going to get into that more in a minute. But given at creation, despised it the tree, longed for throughout the ages and made available through Messiah. See, the promise of God has been operating under a different set of parameters since the fall, right? The promise was present before the fall, but now it's operating under a different set of parameters in the fall. Okay, and that's important to remember. Okay, now we stand at the end. No question about that. Anybody feel like they're in the end times? If not, come talk to me. I'd like to hear what your life's all about and what you're experiencing. It's a time of mercy and judgment preparing for his eventual return. So what does it mean that we're currently living in this time of mercy and judgment? What does it mean judgment? We know that in the garden, right, there was the fall. And because of the fall, there were judgments handed out, right? And these judgments, okay, the initial judgment was the death that occurred that they weren't even aware of, maybe, that did occur because it wasn't a physical death, but it was a spiritual death. We'll get into that some more, too. Okay, so what does it mean? Let's talk about currently living in in a time of mercy and judgment. We're going to go to James. Okay, James is really good about this. James 2, 12 and 13. This is out of the CSB or HCSB, depending on what you go by. But same, it's the same translation. Speak and act as those who are to be judged by the law of freedom. What's that? James is talking about this law of freedom. We really need to understand that a little bit. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. 
Okay, because if we don't understand this law of freedom, right, then then we're not going to understand what is going on here in this time that we exist in. And this is what we're talking about, because James was written in the con in the time you know of Christ that we live in, right? We live in the time of Christ, the time of the Gentiles. Okay, so that being said, for verse thirteen, for judgment is without mercy. Oof. Thank God it doesn't stop there, though, right? Thank God James didn't just stop there. To the one who has shown no mercy. Okay, so there's a condition on this judgment that will not be merciful, but it requires the individual to be merciful, right? And this is important that we don't miss this, because, and he goes on even to say, to make sure we get his point, James even goes on to say in his final statement, mercy triumphs. Over judgment. Well, it's starting to talk to now the individual responsibility, right? Because James is addressing individuals. He's not addressing, he is addressing the church in general. And we're going to talk about that as we progress through these messages. But it's important to remember that, that all of this, we, all of this is going down to the point of salvation of the individual, right? And as we teach many, many, many times, you know, our salvation is not for ourselves, but we have a responsibility to fulfill the salvation that we walk in, and that's what we're going to talk about as we develop this. So this is clearly a declaration of these two nations are now existent at this time. We live in it. We live in it. And it's life and death. Okay, so this is the way I want you to think about it. There's a kingdom of life, a nation of life. That would be heaven, Christ, the, the Godhead, all of that. Everything was beautiful in the beginning where there was one kingdom, right? Just one, just one. And it was God and man cohabitating in the kingdom of God under the promise that we're going to go into a little bit more in Genesis in a moment. Okay, so this, this is important that we understand these nations exist and we have to acknowledge they exist. Okay, and this brings me to my point. When sin entered into the earth, death entered also. No doubt there. Now we know that. This was immediately evident spiritually, while naturally the consequences required more time to manifest. This transfer from life to death is still evident today. What's the point here? I want you to recognize these two nations exist, that it entered at this point, and there was a spirit, immediate spiritual death and, and the prolonged working out of the physical death, okay? So it is with us. You know, we have a life. We can actually live apart from God our entire life life. Well, that's still a life, right? Because we're still alive, but it's dead to the spirit. And then we're going to develop this a little bit more so we understand the connection and how we operate, because we really need the context of where we live today. It's good to study the scriptures. It's good to understand how these things all originated, but it's also important for us to contextualize it into our daily existence. And that's where hopefully this you know, teaching this this prophecy, this parable will go, you know, because um, I believe it really is. He explained to me as it is actually a parable of two nations. And I'm like, huh? <laughs> and he's talking about this thing that's been in creation since the fall, because in the fall, it introduced another way, not the way, right? Okay. So we'll develop that as we go along as well. So What's this first nation? Let's start here in Genesis 1, 26 to 27. Okay, this is out of CSB as well. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, the creatures, and crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. Okay. So what is this stating here? It's stating that man has been given in his creation itself the authority to rule and reign over the earth. It's clear in the scriptures. So here it is, the first nation in heaven operating in earth through Adam and Eve. Now they've been given the, the, the authority to rule and reign. And because of that, they're now responsible for fulfilling all that God desires for mankind to be. Don't miss that. And that's why the fall, when we see the fall, it tragically affects all mankind because they were given that responsibility. Okay? 
This is confirmed, of course, in Acts 7, 20, 17, 26 to 27. From one man he made every nationality to live under the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and boundaries of where they live. He's referring to Adam there. And you know it's Adam. It's not actually not his name. It means mankind. Man, you know, that's what it means. Okay, and creating the image and likeness of God. Hey, there's a great mystery. You can go as deep as you want into that. I encourage you to challenge the Lord and go, hey, explain Genesis to me a little bit more. Let me understand what it is, Lord. I had to do this. I had to, you got to open me up and teach me deeper of what it means to be yours because ah, these concepts are deep and they're difficult for us. They're not deep or difficult for him, but for us, they are. Okay, and so this first nation, here it is, is being declared. They have appointed times and boundaries where they live. Verse 27, he did this so they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out find him, though he's not far from each one of us. So there it is. He's confirming the promise in the New Testament through the writer of Acts. He's declaring, is being declared to us. The promise is still present. Don't miss that, okay? So the promise is still available because Acts is the, is, is the age that we live under. Acts is still active today, okay? Don't miss that. Yes, it was written 2,000 years ago, but we're still in that same age, okay? So don't miss that. OK, so so to go there, we have to understand that that this this confirmation, then we need confirmation. We need to understand where's this idea of the second nation come from. And let's go back to Genesis three, eight through nine. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden at the time of the evening. Now, this is Genesis, right? This is later in, in chapter three. So, so they're, hang, they're there, the fall has happened, they hear the Lord, and they hid, they hid from God among the trees of the garden. Don't miss of the trees of the garden. They hid behind the natural cover. Why? Because that's all they had. They'd already spiritually fallen. They had no connection in the spirit any longer, so they only had what we would call the carnal or the natural, and they hid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear Lord. So the Lord God called out the man and said to him, where are you? Do you think God doesn't know where he is? It's a great question that we, you know, we, could, we could intimate from it that God somehow lost sight of them. Well, maybe. Uh, I don't think that's the case. I mean, that would say that God's got blind spots, and I don't think that's the case at all. But if you want to argue that point, go argue that point. My point here is, is that they were aware that their situation had changed. Whatever they were previously and their relationship to God, they, it was different now. And we have within the account, it actually speaks to this clearly. You can go read it. Okay, so where are you? God's question, where are you, is not a question of, I can't see you. It's, what have you done? Why did you go away from me? Because again, he never leaves us nor forsakes us, right? And this is where the, we're at the second nation. So now this is the idea of the second nation. They're no longer in the first nation in, in complete relationship relating through the spirit and, and, and in the cool of the day walking with him. No, nope. they're in another place. So this is this where this idea of a second nation is birthed. And this is the idea of life versus death. And that's the connection with it, okay? It's important that we understand that uh, God is trying to help man here, not accuse man. The, the question isn't, where have you gone? It's, why have you separated yourself from me? Right. And so God's developing this with, with them. OK. And so it's also confirmed in Acts 17, 30 and 31, because it's important that we have witnesses to these things. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent. Hey, this is this is New Testament all the way, baby. Yeah. But remember, it goes all the way back to the garden. OK, because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. Oh, oh, OK. He has provided proof to this by everyone by raising him from the dead. So, OK. 
So there, there's a righteousness that God is going to bring into the earth that's going to, he's going to use to ju- judge the earth or the world, it says here. And this righteousness is actually no longer connected with the first man, but now we have second man. We know that's Christ. It's speaking of Christ directly here. We understand it's Messiah. This has been the promise of Messiah all along. It's made by God in the beginning that Messiah is going to come. Well, well you know, you know the story. You know the story. So the reality is, is that now we have Jesus in judgment, not just judgment. Okay, because judgment occurred in the garden. We have it in the garden story. But now we have Jesus as that addition, that mediator, that inter- that intercessor, whatever, however you want to process it. He's actually the one who can redeem us. Right. We know that. But again, we're developing this. Okay. So here, this is where we're at. You are here. This is your, you know, if you got the the wall chart and trying to figure out, where am I at in my life, Lord? What am I doing? What are you doing? There's that little red dot. You are here. This is it. Acts 17, 30, and 31. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, right? This is what he talked about in 30 and 31. I I want us to recognize it's the same scripture we just talked about, but it's talking about there's a judge coming into the world in righteousness. And that's the recognition that Jesus has come to judge. And we'll delve into that farther. I know you you biblical scholars would question what I just said, maybe. But just put put a pin in that. We'll get back to it. Okay, yeah. But we need to lean into the fact that it's already declared in Acts, confirmed by Acts, and in Genesis, if you go to other parts of Genesis, that Messiah will come as a propitiation, as a substitute for our sin. Okay, and this is important because, again, we're trying to understand where's the promise and then these two nations. The promise hasn't changed. Don't forget that. The promise hasn't changed. The implementation or, or the process of the, of the promise coming into creation. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's changed. But the promise is still the same, that men will be with God, created in His image and likeness, and will be one with Him, and we will have the authority to rule and reign over the earth. Okay, so don't forget that. That promise is still active. We're not operating in it successfully right now because of the fall. Okay, so I'm sure you're saying, yeah, yeah, but I know Jesus, you know. He, don't miss this. It's not enough to know Jesus. You're like, what do you mean it's not enough to know Jesus? Here's what I mean. Knowing him isn't enough. And I'm going to explain it in a minute, but I'm going to give you a scripture reference that shows what I'm telling you is the truth. Okay? So Acts 19, verses 13 and 14. Now, some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists, we know that's the seven sons of Sceva. We know these guys have been exorcising demons out of people, right? This is what Acts is talking about here, okay? And this isn't the first time they've done this. That's important. They're recognized in the scripture as Jewish exorcists. Also, very interesting, attempted to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, quote, I command you by the... By the Jesus that Paul preaches, end quote. Yep. And the seven sons of Sceva of the Jewish high priests were doing this. So what do you say? These guys say, I know Jesus. They actually say, I know Paul who preaches Jesus, so I know Jesus, right? Isn't enough. Remember, we know what happened to them, right? How, how did it fare for the seven sons of Sceva in the story that comes out in Acts here? <laughs> They got a whooping, right? They got such a bad whooping. The whooping was so bad, they came out naked. Why? Because the demon they met said, well, hold it a minute. Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. Who are you? What? Hold it. I know Jesus. Yeah, but what's the demon saying? Does he know you? <laughs> oh, Wow. And that's what I'm trying to say. It isn't enough. I have people that have done this through my, my walk. Well, I know Jesus. I know, that's great. But this, it's, I'm not asking that question. My question I'm asking, and I'm asking it to you now, is does Jesus know you? Because that's where the rubber meets the road. Sons of Son Skiva, prove it right here. <laughs> I've never been beat so bad that my clothes were ripped off, okay? But this is what happened to seven of them. Seven. 
You're telling me three of them couldn't get away or four of them couldn't get away while the other, come on. This is a serious beating, okay? That, what's the point? The point is, is that the spiritual realm is real. The, the consequences of the fall released into our earth the ability for certain forces of evil to operate at a level they were never able to operate at before the fall. Argue, don't argue, I don't care. I'm just telling you, here it's proven these things have power. They even have authority over who? The seven sons of Sceva. How can they have authority over the seven sons of Sceva? Because they're not saved. Wow. So, so the promise of Messiah is present. These guys are appropriating the promise of Messiah being present through Paul. And the demon looks at him and goes, not enough. <laughs> you came up a little short and let me show you how short you came up. And he whooped them. He whooped them. He kicked them all over the place. What's the point you're trying to make, Pastor? It just, I got to drive this home. It is not enough to know Jesus. We... We have a scripture in John. It, it's one of the most misquoted scriptures to me in my experience that I've experienced people misquote to me. And the scripture is out of John. And it says, narrow is the gate and fewer there that find it. Y'all familiar with that one? Guess what? I just misquoted the scripture to you. <laughs> As it was misquoted to me hundreds of times. It's not what the scripture says. If you read it fully, it says, Narrow is the gate, and difficult is the road beyond it, and few are there that find it. What's your point? My point is this. The reality is we know the gate. You, you say the name of Jesus in this earth, and you get a response. There's nobody who goes, who's that? What are you talking about? Huh? Who that? No, 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 no. They're either going to respond positively, negatively, or somewhere in the middle of that, trying to figure stuff out. What's your point? My point is, it's not enough to know him. You know, he has to know you. And there's a process set out in scripture from the beginning to the end that says, this is how it works. You can't change the, the process to redeem you because of the fall. You can't change that. The consequences came because of the fall. And the way for those consequences to be overcome was defined by our Father, who is the authority because of the promise that He's still maintaining and managing. And we're going to talk about that some more, too, because He's the one who's, who's, who's managing the promise because mankind fell. We can't manage the promise anymore. Our, it was broke. We broke our covenant with God. And because of our breaking covenant with God, we now stand naked in a world that just wants to destroy us. And this is a condition of mankind until Messiah came. And then Messiah came and he gave us a new hope. And this is where we now have, we no longer have just judgment. We have Jesus and judgment. And it's better. Trust me, it's better than before Christ. Okay. To be a Jew, great. That's awesome. But you, being a Jew, you still couldn't be saved. The law couldn't save the Jews. This is Jesus speaking. I'm not making this stuff up. It's him. He says this stuff. What we have to do is we have to figure out what is, what is it, our individual responsibility and how do we line ourselves? We must align ourselves. This is important. Everything that has been, needed to be done has been done. Everything that needs to be spoken has been spoken. The reality is, is that it's all already finished in the celestial. It's done. The issue is it has to play out within time. Celestial is outside of time. We're within time in this earth. And therefore, this is going to play out the way it plays out. Now, eventually, it will come to an end. And we know that. We're, we know the end. We, we talk about that a lot. We may talk about it during this series. We'll see. But here's where I want to, I want to kind of finish this up and bring it to an end here. Is I, I want to talk about, you know, that it isn't, I, I got to drive this point home. It isn't enough that you know Jesus he must know you. And, and I know my response to people telling me statements that I didn't agree with. And, you know, I do agree with this statement, but I have plenty of statements that were spoken to me through my journey. And through that journey, I didn't like what people were saying to me. Maybe in the truth, I didn't know at the time or I did know at the time, but I just didn't like them saying it to me. And my response was, what, is, what have I done? What is my crime? You know, 
Let's go back to James. Let's, let's handle that one first. Let's handle that question. What have I done wrong? James 2.1, and we're going to do 6 and 7. My brothers and sisters. Okay. James is talking to his brothers and sisters, which means what? Those who declare Christ as their Savior. So don't miss that. He's talking to each one of us. Okay. All right. Do not show favoritism as you hold on to the faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Yet you have dishonored the poor. Huh? Doesn't the rich oppress you and drag you into court? Don't they blaspheme the good name of, that was invoked over you? What is it James is talking about here? Well, it's all summed up in his opening statement. Do not show favoritism. Let me sh use another way of saying that. Do not judge another brother's call, walk, or life. Ooh, we don't like that. Yeah. You're starting to meddle now, Mark. You're, you're meddling a little bit. Just stop meddling. Get, get back in the pastor role. Stop meddling. I hear you. I know. Been there, done it. I understand. I get it. But we have to meddle in the lies so that we can bring forth the truth. And my desire is, is that the dis personal discovery that I've gone through is he's opened this word and given me the understanding of this word will also apply to your life. I would be remiss. I'd be lacking. I'd fall short of the call and purpose on my life if I didn't genuinely pursue clarity and understanding in what the Lord is speaking to each one of us about the promise and the two nations. It's a critical time we're in. We don't, have, we don't have to go very far into social media, news, media, whatever your source of events is, to realize we need help. I'm telling you right now, our help isn't going to come politically. It isn't even going to come nationally. Oh, we don't like that. But as we develop this, you're going to start to understand what I actually said. You just hold on. I put a pin in that one as well. And, the, and then spiritually, we've got to come to a whole new place. Why? Because it's through the promise that these other things can come to be. And this is the important thing that we're going to develop over the coming weeks. We're going to develop the reality that the promise hasn't changed. The outpouring or the application of the promise in the fall has changed. There's, there's new ways of doing things that are needed to be done so that the promise will be fulfilled by men. Because again, God's are still maintaining the promise. God hasn't changed his mind about you and me. He hasn't changed his mind. He's waiting for us to come into agreement with who he said we already are in Genesis. Anyway, can't beat that horse much longer. I could, but it won't do any good. So, so I'm sure there may be one or two out there that go, hey, 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 hold on. You can't judge me, man. Word's really clear. Don't judge me, brother. I agree. I'm not judging you. I'm declaring a truth to you and saying you need to look at this seriously. And if you figure it doesn't apply to your life, praise be to God, that's on you. I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to draw judgment on you. In fact, you want to know something? Jesus said he isn't going to judge you either. <gasps> what you talking about? He is the judge. Hmm. He isn't going to judge you. He may be the judge, but he ain't going to judge you. There's already evidence that he will use to draw his verdict. And this is what he's speaking to in John 12, 48. The one who rejects me and doesn't receive my sayings has this as his judge. This is Jesus speaking. The word. Ooh, we like the word. We're word people. I have spoken. Ooh, woo, woo. We'll judge him on the last day. What are you saying? I'm saying he made it clear by the words that he spoke while he was here on the earth that this is the way you must go. Did he not say I'm the way, the truth, and life? Come on. What's the way? The way is doing it his way. You can't do it any other way. You can try, but it's on you. So we'll end here. Hopefully you've caught it that 
this, this reality of this idea that the promise is the original promise from God. It's the one promise that we're still operating under today. It's still available today. However, we can only acquire it through uh, the new way, which we're going to get into more. We're going to get into that more, okay? But the reality is we're, we're, there's a nation of life and there's a nation of death, right? And this is, this is where we're going to end today. This is kind of the framework for where we're going to go the next three weeks. It's important that we understand the concepts that I've developed in this particular video. If you don't, review it. Do it again. Just go back to it. Whatever. And so next week, we're going to talk about um, one nation and we're going to bring it into where God brought it into related to America, because this is actually how he developed this prophetic word. And so I'm going to bring you into the to the understanding that I had through him speaking directly to America and, and, and as a nation more generally so that we can comprehend what it is he's actually speaking to each one of us. So you have a responsibility now to understand what I've just told you. I have a responsibility now to um, live out what I preached um, I'll say this, hang in there. I know it's tough. I know it's a little bit deep. I know it's, some of it doesn't taste good. I get it. Let me bless you. Let me pray for you and we'll let you go for this time. Okay. Father, I thank you that you've begun to develop an understanding and a comprehension of who you are and what you are and the promise that you made in the beginning and your desire to fulfill it in the lives of each one of us. You've made the way You've made it clear to us. You've shown us the process. Now we as individuals must come into agreement and obedience with what you've already said we need to do. Lord, I pray for each one that's listening, that you bring them wisdom, understanding and knowledge from on high, that you'd make this clear to them, Lord. Any, anything that I've spoken that is unclear, that you'd bring clarity to it by the power of your spirit dwelling within them. And through that relationship, Lord God, they would come to a deeper understanding and appreciation of what it truly means to be able to acquire the promise, because many cannot. For the glory of your Son, for his kingdom come, and all God's people said, Amen. All right, loved ones, until next time, just hang in there. Um, you know, once again, thank you for being with us at Immersion Church and hope to see you soon. God bless.